Welcome to today's Network Commons. Network Commons is a live online discussion series developed by the Build Healthy Places Network, featuring leaders involved in cross-sector strategies to build a culture of health in, and well-being in America. My name is Rini Roy Elias. I'm the Manager of Strategic Programs and Research at the Build Healthy Places Network, and I'll be serving as today's moderator for our discussion on measurement specifically highlighting how those across the community development and health sectors are measuring neighborhood level health and well-being to advance the culture of health. Today's event is a very special occasion for a number of reasons. The topic of measurement is actually a core area of focus for the Build Healthy Places Network. And as some of you know, one of our flagship resources is Measure Up, a curated microsite featuring tools case studies and research on measuring the health value of community development. And Measure Up actually represents our effort to synthesize the most useful resources out there so that they are more accessible and understandable to those in the field. And in fact, all of the work you'll see featured today is on Measure Up. So we're especially excited for our speakers to join us today. Today also marks our 10th Network Commons my colleague Daniel and I, Daniel Lau and I came up with the idea to do this series back in 2015, not long after we started our jobs here at the network. We're both usually behind the scenes managing production of the event with the rest of our team, so I'm particularly honored to be in front of the camera today. I will share that we certainly didn't expect how tremendous a response we would receive since launching this event. In the last two years, we've showcased almost 40 leaders representing a wide range of organizations, including hospitals, public health departments, nonprofits, academic institutions, community development corporations, community development financial institutions, or CDFIs, and others. And we've reached nearly 4,000 people nationwide in discussions about cross-sector topics, spanning impact investing for health, hospital community partnerships, and early childhood and its intersections with community development. And today alone, we've broken our own record with almost 900 people registered. So a wholehearted thank you to you, our audience, for driving these important national conversations. Please do keep Network Commons in mind as a resource for your work. And with that, I'd like to move to today's program. Today, we're lucky to have four national metrics leaders with expertise spanning community development, public health, and healthcare. And for those of you new to community development, we at the network define it as a $200 billion sector that invests in low and moderate income communities through the development and financing of affordable housing, grocery stores, community centers, clinics, and other neighborhood level projects that improve the underlying conditions where people live to support health and well being. Today, each of our speakers will share their work on four unique measurement tools, which are distinct in their intended users and applications, but commonly incorporate a broad definition of health. That is, the social determinants of health, which we often talk about in the public health, in the public health field. And while measurement has historically been within the domain of public health, I'm particularly excited that we're having a truly cross-sector conversation today about health metrics. This reflects the national movement of non-medical fields, particularly community development, working with those in public health and healthcare to address neighborhood level health and well-being and the measurement of their impact. You can read our speakers' full bios by clicking the links that you'll see shortly in your chat box, but I'd like to provide brief introductions before starting our discussion. First, I'd like to welcome Vedette Gavin, who is joining us today from Boston. Vedette has a background in public health and is the Conservation Law Foundation Ventures Director of Research. She specifically is supporting an evaluation of the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund, a $30 million private equity fund focused on equitable transit-oriented development in Massachusetts. Today, Vedette will share her work related to the fund's health scorecard which draws from a health impact assessment to prioritize and target investments. Next, I'd like to introduce Tiffany Manuel. 
Tiffany is joining us today from Columbia, Maryland, not far from my hometown of Bowie. Tiffany is the Vice President of Knowledge, Impact, and Strategy for Enterprise Community Partners, a leading national community development financial institution or nonprofit bank. Tiffany leads Enterprise's data and research work, and today she will share her latest project, Opportunity 360, a comprehensive database using cross-sector data that was just launched last month. Next, I'd like to welcome Jessica Mulcahy. Jessica is joining us today from Boston, where she is Director of Philanthropic Evaluation at Success Measures, a social enterprise at NeighborWorks America, one of the nation's leading intermediaries in the community development and affordable housing field. Jessica has an interesting background as a cultural anthropologist with experience in mixed method evaluation. Today, she will share her current work with Success Measures Health Tools, a new set of data collection instruments to measure the health outcomes of community development work. And finally, I'd like to introduce Carly Riley. Carly is joining us today from Cincinnati, where she is Assistant Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. She is also an advisor to the 100 Million Healthier Lives, a collaboration of change agents worldwide convened by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement with the goal of 100 million people living healthier lives by 2020. Today, she will share her work developing the organization's Adult Wellbeing Survey, a validated brief questionnaire that can be used to measure individual well-being among adults with the social determinants of health in mind. So thank you all for coming. We're really pleased to have you here today. I'm going to kick things off with our speakers um, by having them provide brief introductions of their respective measurement work. And then we'll spend the latter half of today's discussion hearing from you. And by the way, thank you to everyone who submitted questions earlier while registering for the event. You can continue to share your questions and comments using the Q&A option, um, which shows up on the side of your screen. And please note that this is separate from the chat box. We'll also be following Twitter, so you can send us and the rest of the world messages using, using the hashtag network comments, all one word. So we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. With that, I'd like to start with Vidette. Vidette, can you tell us about the origins of the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund's health scorecard, um, how it has been used, and what you've learned in your evaluations of the fund? Sure. Thanks, Rini, and happy anniversary to you and the Build Healthy Places um, Network on the webinar, and thank you for having me. Um, CLF is uh, New England's oldest and largest environmental advocacy organization where we use advocacy markets and the law to uh, create a healthy and vibrant New England for all people, which includes not only a healthy natural environment, but a built environment, particularly neighborhoods where people live and where health is formed. Um, and one of our market strategies is the Healthy Neighborhoods Equity Fund, which is, as you mentioned, a $30 million private equity fund that's focused on financing transit-oriented development projects um, for mixed incomes that are in uh, neighborhoods where these projects are typically difficult or nearly impossible to finance. Um, we developed the fund in partnership with the Massachusetts Housing Investment Corporation here, um, and we launched it to make the case that you can finance development in a way that both produces financial returns and improves health and well-being in a measurable way at the population level. And we used measurement in the fund in two ways. First, as a screening tool to identify the communities and projects to invest in. Um, and then after we've invested, we use it in our research and longitudinal study to understand how our investments are actually changing neighborhoods and how those changes in neighborhoods are impacting people. And I'll just briefly provide a 30 second blurb about each. So we use our screening tool in the fund called the Health Score, um, which helps us determine where to invest funds. It's a collection of over 50 different measures um, and acts as a weighted scorecard that looks at both the neighborhood context 
or the need for a development project and the individual projects and how well they can actually meet that need. It allows us to quantify and compare communities, identifying the greatest need and where we think we'll see the most measurable impact, and then look at the actual design of each project and how it fits into the community and how well positioned it actually is to deliver that impact. We developed our health score scorecard using a health impact assessment actually, and we used it to identify the links between transit oriented development and health. And then we selected measures for each one of those uh, linkages or pathways that we found and weighted them according to the level of evidence for each. We then rolled up each one of those domains. So we looked at, you know, walkability, affordability, housing, green space, looked at the rate of evidence for the impact of health of each and rolled it up into an overall score. Um, and we used that score to then invest in the projects that produce the highest score. In our research, we uh, are looking to better understand how those investments actually improve health. And to do that, we go directly to the residents and ask them to develop their own measures of success um, for what a healthy neighborhood development looks like, and then what a healthy lifestyle related to those developments look like. Um, and we know that making our investments change a number of factors in community, in a community, it can help improve walkability and green space and affordability, but it can also change other things like access um, or mobility or displacement rates and things that have ad adverse effects on health. And so through this research, we're kind of learning how changing a dynamic context in the neighborhood through development, transit oriented development actually impacts life experiences, lifestyle and population health. And I'll explain a little bit more hopefully later in the conversation. Great, thank you, Vidette. And you know, I'll, I'll just quickly note, um, we have chatted in a slide deck that includes screenshots that kind of speak to all of our speakers' talking points. So please do open up those slides and you know, please refer to them as the speakers are, are giving their intros. And I'll mention that you know, as we at the network, we've been big fans of, of Vidette's work and the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund, um, because even though it's geographically focused on Massachusetts, you know, it, there are a lot of learnings that can be applied to other places, particularly the, the fact that an HIA, health impact assessment, helps inform the impact metric. And, um, and you know, I'm hoping in the Q&A, Vidette, we can hear more about the evaluation project and specifically how you're engaging communities in that measurement process, because I think that gets to the core of, of often one of the, quest the key questions that comes up about how do you make the measurement process equitable as well as the actual project you know, that you're measuring. So with that, um, let's move on to Tiffany. Um, Tiffany, so Opportunity 360 has a similar focus on equity as the scorecard, but it's a database that has broad applications for community developers who are seeking to make the business case for, their, for investment. Can you share a little bit about why Opportunity 360 was developed for whom and how it fits into Enterprise's work? Sure, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Happy to uh, be on the uh, panel today to talk about this important work. But I'll say just as a little bit of background is Opportunity 360 really began as Enterprise was coming out of a strategic plan and trying to think very strategically about how we measure the success that we're having in changing places, whether that be in changing the housing, stability of neighborhoods and communities, whether that be in the health space, a lot of our work is sort of the intersection between health and housing, whether that be in transit-oriented development or a variety of other things that enterprise invests in. And we invest both capital, so we, we invest about uh, six or seven, uh, most years, good years, six or seven billion dollars of capital in communities across the country each year in a variety of different things. But we also invest our, our time and talent, our expertise, uh, our policy resources, our programmatic resources in places. And so from our vantage point, we wanna be thoughtful about how we're measuring that, as you said, uh, not just because we think that it helps folks to understand the value of enterprise, but because we think it helps folks understand why this investment in community is important and can actually yield, uh, as Bedez said, not just financial returns for investors, but also the social returns. So we began this process of thinking about what would a tool look like that best met our needs for how we understand how neighborhoods and communities are changing as a result of all kinds of investments that we're making of capital, of time, of expertise, of policy resources, programmatic resources. And, um, 
And one of the interesting thing about that, we recognize there were a lot of tools on the market, but one of the things that came back very quickly is, is one, we need a broader framework for understanding opportunity overall, not just health, not just housing, not just transit, but how do you bring those things together in a very multi-sector way, right? What's happening often is that we work in silos, so the housers are often their silos, the health folks are often their silos. And, you know, the problems that communities face are, all, are, are usually not siloed problems. They're interconnected problems that require interconnected solutions. And so we're seeing a lot more of the sort of cross-sector uh, inclination uh, evolve. And we need a data platform that supports that. But I think broader than that, I think for Enterprise Advantage Point, we really saw an opportunity to help the field, not just of community development folks, but people who are interested in changing for the better communities, the, the, um, a data platform that would help them understand what's happening in communities and how communities are changing. So when you go into Opportunity 360, what you find is four, I would say, sort of buckets of work for us, a measurement tool where you can put in any address in the country, and it will spit, it, it's a street address, and it will spit back out to you in about five or seven seconds, a 25-page report about what's happening in that neighborhood. Um, and not only just the metrics that relate to that neighborhood and health, but health and housing, transit, et cetera, and not only just about those sectors, but that neighborhood compared to every other neighborhood in the nation, then compared to every other, every other neighborhood in the state, and then every other neighborhood in the region. And so what you get is both the granularity of what's happening at a neighborhood level, but then also the, the ability to contextualize that. How does it compare to other places and over time? And that kind of strategic intelligence was missing, we felt, from the field, not just in the places where we work, but every neighborhood should have access to that kind of data uh, avail availability. Um, there are also other tools on the site around how we listen carefully to what's happening for residents and the kinds of things that are emerging for them in terms of how they define opportunity. That is critically important because oftentimes the official story of what's happening in neighborhoods is in one, has, all, has, has one set of data, but when you listen to residents, you may get a very different understanding of what's actually happening in those neighborhoods and what the priorities are for development. And we really felt that those two data sources needed to exist side by side because often those things exist and both things are true, right? The sort of official data story about how you have parks and neighborhoods, et cetera. But they also there's the story that residents will tell you may be very different. Um, there's a partner tool, so you can find partners in the neighborhood or region relevant to the issues that you're working on. Often that is an issue. We want to make sure we are bringing uh, cross-sector or multi-sector collaborations together. And then a variety of resources about how you calculate the social return on the investments that we're making. So I can certainly stop there. There's a lot in the, in the, in the Opportunity 360, but the idea is how do we build the capacity of folks who are working in neighborhoods and communities to see over time the, the, the transition in those neighborhoods to tell the story and then to make a stronger case for the investments that they need in those places. Great, thank you, Tiffany. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll quickly mention that um, we were actually playing around with Opportunity 360 at the office just the other day and looking up our, our own hometowns and kind of comparing it against San Francisco. And the report function is really a powerful tool. So we're, we're really excited to, to have it. So thank, thank you, Tiffany. Um, let's move on to Jessica. So Jessica, you've played an important role at Success Measures in its work as an established evaluation resource for community development organizations. Can you talk about Success Measures' newest measurement tools, um, specifically geared towards helping community-based groups evaluate health impacts? Sure. Thanks, Rini, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share our work with you all. So the Success Measures health tools were developed it's starting in about 2014, and we identified a gap. So there's the community development organizations were recognizing through the social determinants of health research that they were making these contributions towards health and intuitively understood that, but lacked a framework and a set of uh, community-friendly tools to be able to really evaluate that and make it specific and understand and track that over time. So we began the process of um, developing a set of tools by first doing a literature review and really addressing kind of what's out there in public health and for uh, community health, um, community development and housing and really looking at the indicators that related to health. Um, and based on that, put together a cross-sectoral advisory group that comprised all those different sectors. 
And um, they were willing to sit down with us and over a period of about six months, develop a, a really broad framework of what they saw as contributing you know, from the, from the community development field and the social determinants of health, what those frameworks were for understanding how health outcomes happened over the short, mid, and long term. And so from that, we developed a set of 68 data collection tools, most of them focused on collecting primary level data through surveys, interviews, key informant uh, questionnaires, as well as observations and assessments, um, and tried to sort of operationalize a lot of those indicators. We then went through a field testing process where we worked in partnership with nine different community development organizations across the U.S. and field tested the tools at the question level um, in English and in Spanish. And we do participatory outcome evaluation, so it's very important to us that the tools be, you know, reliable and, um, and, and provide quality data and also be friendly for community development practitioners who might not have a research background but that also from the respondent side that they provide a positive experience um, and an, a way to, to provide questions that can be answered. Um, so for example, from the field test, we did things like, you know, change kind of the way we ask about physical activity and instead of just asking about hours spent and heart rates, really kind of getting the context of what people were able to do. And so kind of contextualizing that within exercising within your ability or having activity within your ability really allowed people to answer and feel good about their answer and feel like the, the interviewer could understand their perspective um, as opposed to sort of some, um, some of the more straightforward questioning. Um, I think that also comes with a cultural lens that so we were careful to sort of think about um, to recognize sort of social networks and communities when looking at healthy behaviors and eating behaviors. And so simple word changes like um, asking people how many home cooked meals they ate a week rather than how many times they ate at home really allowed for folks who had those more extended networks to talk about their food habits in ways that reflected um, the truth of, of kind of where they were, were getting their food. Um, so based on that, we, we changed a lot of the questions and we've now had um, two projects that where we've launched the tools. One is a completed pilot that Naval Works America uh, sponsored with 10 organizations. And the second is a multi-year project that we're actually doing in partnership with Enterprise, uh, where 20 organizations are collecting data over three years to understand the changes that their programs are contributing to in terms of health outcomes. Um, they do that by simply kind of going through with technical assistance, you know, a normal evaluation planning process where they identify their outcomes and then go through the tools kind of like a library to select the questions that best match the outcomes they're trying to understand. Um, and so just a brief example, um, one organization is looking at the benefits of providing affordable housing with wraparound services to recently homeless individuals. And so they are using the tools to understand how their work is contributing to decreased stress, increased use of services, and improved eating behavior. Um, another example is an organization providing resident services, and so evaluating their community gardens and healthy cooking classes by asking about access to foods that residents prefer and changes in their eating behavior. Um, so I'll end with that, and just to say that um, in the chat, there will be uh, a link if you're interested. The tools are going to be available online for free in an online publication coming out next month. And uh, there'll be a link in the chat where you can click and uh, sign up to receive those. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you, Jessica. Um, something that, that I'm hoping we get to in the Q&A is you know, to, to talk a little bit more about this role of primary data in complementing the secondary data sources that are out there to measure health. Because um, I could totally see, you know, the success measures health tools complementing many of the tools we talked about today, like Opportunity 360. And, you know, it, it sounds like success measures and, you know, through its focus on the primary data collection and the survey instruments is really getting to some of these nuances around health that are only possible to really understand when you actually have a conversation with, with people and kind of understand the conditions around um, their their decisions um, you know in their neighborhood so so great to great to get the latest from you on success measures um, thank you so we will now turn to Carly 
Carly, you're a pediatrician and you've been critical in the development of the 100 Million Healthier Lives Adult Wellbeing Assessment. What was your process in developing the tool and what is its relevance both in clinical and community settings? Oh, thank you so very much. It is such a joy to be here today. I am here representing an entire team of people, including Matt Stiefel, Brita Roy, Rohit Ramaswamy, Shoma Stout, and many others. And together we developed the 100 Million Healthier Lives measurement approach, really to give people and groups some simple, powerful tools to understand, track, and improve health, well-being, and equity in their communities and populations over time. We recognize that people define health and well-being for themselves, and we embrace person-reported measures of health and well-being. As an initiative, 100 Million Healthier Lives has adapted the domains of the WHO definition of health, which include physical, mental, and social well-being, adding a spiritual component to well-being, including joy and purpose in life. One of the many tools that we created is the Adult Well-Being Assessment. Uh, and you can see that um, pictured in the upper left corner of the slide um, provided for this presentation. Um, with this brief seven item questionnaire using items from validated instruments, you can determine the percent thriving within a community or population, which is the proportion that reports high levels of well being or life satisfaction, assess hope within a community or population, and measure the four domains of well being for understanding what is driving the thriving or suffering in a community or population. We added to this questionnaire items to assess age, gender, race, ethnicity, educational attainment, military service, and zip or postal code to help communities see how well-being differs across different groups and to therefore help identify and track equity gaps. We sought to identify a short or brief set of validated items really to reduce data collection burden. And we also wanted to create a questionnaire that would bring joy and drive improvement. We performed a literature scan we sought instruments and items that had been validated in more than one population. We also uh, incorporated input from more than 35 leading experts, as well as community members from a broad array of communities. The assessment includes seven items comprising overall well being, as well as each of the four domains. All but the item assessing spiritual well being were chosen from item banks. The spiritual well being item was selected from a validated set of items. And this measurement approach is innovative and it requires refinement through application in the field. We piloted the questionnaire in scale communities with really good results and we are now engaged in much broader use and longer term testing of the assessment. Uh, the adult well-being assessment was designed to support community-based improvement by really anyone who cares about improving health outcomes which includes clinicians uh, to your question, Rini. Uh, we are accruing many examples of a wide array of geographic communities across the globe, including many community initiatives that are relatively small in size, to large systems, including health systems such as Kaiser Permanente and the Veterans Administration. Uh, 100 Million Healthier Lives has compiled a compendium of resources, all available at the website 100mlives.org. And in addition to this assessment, we've compiled a list of validated outcome and process measures for communities to evaluate their local initiatives with metrics to measure drivers at three different levels, people, community, and society. And all of these tools are being incorporated into a web-based platform called Measure What Matters to support measurement and improvement efforts. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carly. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention again, please do refer to the, the slide deck that we've chatted in with um, some of the talking points from the speakers today. And um, again, all of these tools are on Measure Up and adult, the adult well-being assessment is actually one of the more recent tools that we've featured on Measure Up. And uh, we were just huge fans of it because it's so simple, but it, gets, it really gets to some of these nuances around health and kind of speaking to some of the work that Jessica is doing at Success Measures, I think it really captures this idea that primary data collection can, you know, can really complement some of the, the great work that's being done around secondary data collection as well. Um, so with that, I think we will move to our audience. Um, we actually received a number of questions as people registered. I think we received over 100. And I, I see that our chat box is very lively too. So we will try to get as, to as many of your questions as we can. Um, 
A question that actually we, we just received and actually came up in some of our pre-submitted questions is um, around resident engagement. So what, what are kind of the, the opportunities and challenges around resident engagement in the measurement process? Um, and and maybe, maybe we can start out with um, the debt and, and we'll have others chime in as, as needed. Sure. Um, I think the great thing about working around health and wellness is that it's something that everyone understands. You don't have to be a professional to understand what your health is. Um, and so one of the things that we do is start with each sector, including residents and community as a sector, and ask them, you know, what is health and wellness to you and how do you currently understand it? How do you measure it? So the interesting thing is, you know, when we talk to our planning authority about walkability, bikeability, and access to healthy food, we can also talk to residents about um, that same thing. What is a, 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 a commuting distance or a, a walkability score that will allow you to have a healthy lifestyle? How do factors of social cohesion or support play into your life? How does access um, afforded by public transit to regional jobs um, or to jobs and development that are located in your neighborhood influence your health? And what we did was allow multiple theories of change to emerge, taking lived experiences that are shared by hundreds of people to be just as much, uh, just as weighty of evidence as things that are published in the literature. And we use those measures that we found were common amongst all the theories of actually, you know, were a lot. So <laughs> starting with community, I think the biggest thing is asking people and you'll find common measures. And the great thing about it is then we can find sources of data from systems. We can look at electronic medical records. We can look at planning data, census data, but we can also collect information directly on the ground and those two sets of data um, complement one another. Great. Um, and any reactions from, from others on our panel today, Jessica? Well, I think um, resident engagement is critical and, and, you know, I think both in the development of our tools and as they're implemented by individual organizations, we encourage them and provide technical assistance to sort of give them some ideas for how to engage residents, both in the planning as well as the implementation and the analysis of the information that they're getting. Um, and certainly the selection of questions and the selection of outcomes, um, you know, should have resident input. Yeah, and I would just follow up on that. I absolutely um, echo what the panelists have already said. I think that this issue of resident engagement is a huge issue, and I think it's going to become a much larger issue as things like social media and other kinds of things uh, make it make kind of kind of give an additional platform for folks to weigh in on what's happening in the neighborhoods and communities mm -hmm. and the things that they know would actually improve both the health of their own individual health and then the health of their families, but also the health of their communities. And quite frankly, we have not, we as professionals, uh, with all our great intentions, have not done a very good job of actually giving folks decision-making power over their own communities. And so sometimes when I hear resident engagement, I get a little nervous because I, I think we're not very clear often about what that means. Does that mean you just want people to co-sign on the kind of interventions that you've already got think for in your community to do? Does that mean that you want folks to show up at a community meeting? You want to feed them cookies? You want to talk about how they can go off and be healthier? Or do you really want to be able to, to understand fundamentally how they see their neighborhood and how they can be embedded in the decisions that are taking place in and around them in the development of those kinds of things? So I think one thing is to be just really clear about what we're trying to do when we say we're going to quote, quote unquote, engage residents. Um, to be authentic about what that means, and then, right, to think about the, me the mechanisms and the platforms that allow you to do that. On Opportunity 360, one of the things we did as part of the listen tool was list several different, um, a couple things. One, list several different listening tools, depending on what you are actually trying to do when you engage, quote, unquote, residents, but also to give a little bit of a typology. There's a whole range of different data and technology platforms to use, given what you want to get out of that. and, and um, so all I'll say is I think the resources to do that from the data technology perspective are, are robust. The, the challenge I would ask us to be thoughtful about is how, what, what are we trying to do when we engage folks and to be authentic about what that means. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. I, I think you're totally on point. And I, I also wanted to quickly mention um, if you wanted to learn more about Opportunity 360 and you know, some of the, the details of what Tiffany described, 
um, there is actually a webinar happening right after our event on Opportunity 360, which we'll be chatting in. Um, so hopefully some of that discussion will be in, the, in that webinar as well. Um, so we have a, a number of questions coming in. So first, why don't I get to this question for Carly? Um, will IHI pursue electronic medical record vendors to adopt the adult well-being assessment tools um, with their reporting tools? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, we, with uh, 100 million healthier lives, um, really have a big tent approach um, to solving problems in that uh, we are really looking to align with and collaborate with um, anyone from small communities to large systems um, who, who really will add um, uh, power uh, to the implementation um, that communities want to, to see and have in order to be able to measure and track and improve um, health and well-being. And part of that is looking at large health systems and how they can incorporate a tool such as the adult well-being assessment um, within um, what they're already doing. Uh, and so um, we have been uh, working uh, deeply with uh, some uh, health systems in particular uh, to really understand how to best operationalize an adult well-being assessment uh, within um, those um, health systems. And uh, hopefully with those um, deep learnings, uh, we will be able to uh, really spread the use of the uh, assessment um, across um, other um, healthcare um, clinics, practices, um, as well as large systems, and hopefully that would include uh, things that would institutionalize or really help support the use of a wide-scale um, use of an instrument uh, that is brief, that resonates with patients and community members, um, that really drives improvements, that allows us to um, have the kind of insight uh, that clinicians and healthcare providers, among many others, um, want to have around what really people feel is their overall um, health and well-being and what areas um, of their health and well-being um, they are the strongest in and which are the ones that they really want to improve upon. Um, and so I would say yes, um, the 100 Million Healthier Lives Initiative is very interested in um, working um, with um, systems level changes such as introducing something like this into um, EHR so it would really support uh, the, the utility of such an assessment. Great, really exciting. And I, I hope that we can continue to be in touch as you know some of those things happen. We, we'd love to be able to feature, feature that on our website and, and let others know. Um, all right, so let's move on to some of these other questions. Um, another question from our chat. Have panelists seen hospitals and healthcare systems using these tools for their CHNA processes? So uh, here in Massachusetts, we have what's called um, the termination of need, where um, hospitals can use some of their community benefits dollars to donate or to make investments back into the community to produce health. Um, and in some of our research communities, we've been able to use the residence measures of what uh, a healthy neighborhood development would look like and what amenities they feel are the greatest priority to have in the neighborhood to be able to provide data that otherwise would not have existed um, for to determine a need. So one of the examples with the slide that you see in the deck is um, a project called the Bartlett Yards, which is a mixed use development project that has some above market and affordable housing mixed into it, um, where the plans were to create um, address the, the lack of access to healthy food, thereby creating um, a local grocery store that was going to have a co-op format. However, the prices for that store were out of the range for the majority of people living there. Um, and according to census data, which would give you kind of that spread of income on average or uh, by black group, that wasn't really discernible. But as Tiffany pointed out, what residents will tell you about that lived experience in the neighborhood can differ quite a bit from the data that we have at the systems level. So by going door to door and, and gathering that information in the community with a large enough sample size, we were able to provide um, that information that allowed one of our local hospital partners to invest in creating a community owned grocery store. Um, and it also supported one of the key tenets of health that was described by the community as the ability to self-determine. And so when we looked at our community research data, one of the things that we found was that the residents said, you know, 
the things that we think matter most for health are housing security, financial security, and the ability to meet your own priorities. And one of our own priorities here is to grow a local food economy and system that we are included in the, both the supply and that we are the customers, but they didn't have a store or a, a front to a platform to be able to do that. And so the hospital was able to invest in helping to develop that. And that's just kind of one example of why being able to have data, both from the community perspective and from the systems perspective is so powerful. Great, great. And, and just on, on, on the topic of, of you know, how this data is applicable to the CHNA community health needs assessment process for hospitals, um, Tiffany, do you see Opportunity 360 as, you know, potentially being a resource for hospitals? Because, I mean, there are actually a lot of tools out there to help hospitals do CHNAs, but um, some of the kind of the, the nuances around health and opportunity are probably not captured in that. So what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So I see, and, and so I see a lot of opportunity for, um, for, for the, in the health and housing space as a, as a kind of cross-sector connection. And I think, of all the, I think, the cross-sector connections that housers are making, I think that health space is really important. From the, from the housing space, health is the place where we have the, the strongest evidence base about why you need a stable place to live. That's the place where you can see uh, people's stress levels go down when they have stable housing. You can see their kids get kind of better educated. You can see the health of their children, asthma, all kinds of issues, especially when it's connected to healthy housing. So from our vantage point, that is a prime connection that we see happening, um, not just in terms of the, the health needs assessment that hospitals are making, but I think increasingly because of the business decisions that hospitals have to make. You know, when we think about um, the ACA and the changes that that has brought to communities, for a lot of communities, it has meant that the housing piece has become huge. For example, hospitals cannot get reimbursed, for example, if people, if you sort of, somebody shows at your hospital, you uh, give them care, they, don't, they, they leave the hospital, they don't know, have any place to go, so they get sick again and they come back. Hospitals cannot get reimbursed for the number of times people come back in the hospital with the same issue. And so what's happening for a lot of hospitals, particularly in urban areas across the country, is that those hospitals are, are trying to figure out a, a strategy around recuperative care because from a business perspective, it doesn't make sense that they, the folks around the hospital don't have access to decent, affordable, stable housing. So I would say from, so my vantage point is CNA, uh, CHNA process, absolutely. But I think for housers, we're looking significantly beyond just that one process to engage hospitals as a way to begin to have a conversation about why housing matters to health and why health access and resources matters to housers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, there, there have been a number of questions about CHNAs, and also just kind of the, the practicalities of using some of the tools that all of you have discussed. Um, so how, so from the perspective, I guess, of someone coming from healthcare, how would you incorporate some of the tools that have been talked about today and some of the data of those tools um, into kind of existing systems, whether it's existing systems for CHNAs or, or others? Um, you know, how, how would one go about doing that? Mm -hmm. And maybe we can start with um, Jessica. Why don't we start with you? Okay, sure. Um, so we have been working with a number of community benefits folks from hospitals to sort of tackle that question and think about it. And one of the part of it is um, part of what they've suggested as, as a way to incorporate it is sort of taking the questions, because our questions are tested for um, you know, reliability and validity, and so being able to kind of use it as a question bank to take those questions for the different dimensions they want to cover, um, which include, you know, social factors, uh, things about housing, things about the public space, green space, those types of things, um, and, and doing that. I think in other cases, and some of the organizations that are using the tools now are in partnerships with hospitals um, or in larger collaboratives, which include folks who've done um, the health impact assessments or the CHNAs for the hospitals. Um, and they have been able to sort of identify where there have been gaps and then cover that part of the data collection and include it as part of the analysis along with um, some of the other work for the secondary data and other, you know, everyone's collecting data all the time. And so I think the challenge has been, um, particularly for collaboratives, is really thinking through who's doing what, 
where is it, what is it appropriate for us to measure and to sort of try to um, integrate their analysis um, and their analysis points so that they're getting the, the biggest um, amount of work for the least uh, the biggest amount of benefit for the least amount of work, I guess, for all the collaborative members. So really thinking through a broader theory of change, thinking through and understanding the cycles of data collection and um, being very intentional about um, what they're receiving and when and, and really interpreting that um, collectively. Great. And Carly, um, maybe you can speak a little bit to how the adult well-being assessment can complement data that's already being collected. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, many uh, health systems as a part of their CHNA process are already incorporating survey-based self-report uh, measures. Many of them are guided um, by the priorities of the healthcare system themselves um, or are very um, clinically um, oriented um, towards services. Adding something along the lines of the adult well-being assessment, already a very brief um, instrument, um, will provide a different lens with which to look at um, patient experience, patient value, um, uh, in a way that is much more um, holistic, um, which really um, provides um, a sense of um, what matters um, ultimately uh, to people. And then maybe a way to take something like um, a holistic measure of, um, of well-being uh, for either patients specifically or the population at large and really understand, um, you know, how is that um, population um, doing overall? And then you can also start to look at how are the other measures that we're already collecting relate to those. And so understanding um, really um, uh, putting in the patient-centered or um, person-centered um, perspective in terms of what is my overall life evaluation um, look like uh, and then how does it relate to the ways in which the health system at large is investing or um, uh, is participating in, in the community and, and shifting uh, the conversation, uh, really the lens um, with which the healthcare system is looking at the investments that they are making. Um, again, it's a very brief um, assessment that already health systems, large health systems are incorporating and finding very powerful. Um, I would say one-on-one -on -one in terms of just interactions with patient and population, but then also just in aggregate um, and really understanding um, what matters um, overall um, to a population, whether it's a patient-defined population or a geography-based population. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Um, so let's move on to some other questions. Our chat box is really buzzing with a lot of questions, so thank you. Um, so there, there is a question about, you know, how do you, what kind of training do you need to actually administer some of these tools, particularly, I guess, um, maybe this applies to success measures and maybe the adult well-being assessment. Um, so what, what's the kind of training that's necessary to be able to properly administer these surveys and collect the data and, and make sense of that data. Um, and there was a question about cultural competency, if that's part of, if, if any of the organizations represented here today um, do provide some training around, you know, the actual data collection process, but also cultural competency as it, as it relates to that. Um, so maybe, Jessica, we can start with you. Sure. Um, so, that's a great question. Um, so as part of what we do at Success Measures is offer technical assistance and training, and that goes through the entire cycle of an evaluation. So planning, um, identifying your outcome, some assistance sort of working on what participatory means and who else you need to include in that decision process. Um, and then also through the implementation and data collection phase and then through analysis, interpretation and communication. So really getting the information out there. Um, I think that we've tried to make data collection tools that are easy to use um, and understand without kind of a very deep research protocol that goes along with it. So there isn't a, an exact script. There's not, you know, you can pick and choose questions. But I do think that a lot of what was raised in the re resident engagement conversation comes up again when you're talking about training for data collection, right? So, or collecting information, interpreting it, which is really being um, clear and honest about 
where the decisions are made and who's making those decisions. Um, and that means I, even the identification of outcomes from programs, who's deciding that, are you including residents in those decisions? Um, and, and what kinds of questions are you asking and, and of whom? And so we suggest um, working with people who are deeply connected with their community. I don't think that collecting, there are some basic things about surveys um, and doing surveys um, that I think you can kind of get from um, if you have evaluation training or you've done any kind of field work. But I don't think that's the rocket science part. I think the, the, the art behind it is really that engagement piece and of doing it in a culturally competent and respectful manner. And um, I think a lot of that comes naturally to folks who are rooted in working in their communities and maybe being open um, to sort of challenging each other. If you've got residents working with you on the plan, for example, about how that happens, when it happens, um, and you know the process and the timeline for all of that. When you get to analysis, I do think that having, um, you know, we've done a lot of successful organizations have successfully partnered with um, public health folks or universities or um, other institutions where consultants, um, you know, where that expertise around statistical analysis, if that's your approach or qualitative analysis exists. Um, and I do think calling in for help on those places, if that's not the training of the folks using the tool is really important. Um, to the quality of your work and really thinking through what you can say about it um, and, you know, who you're talking about. So I think there are lots of resources out there. It doesn't have to cost millions of dollars um, to do it. And, I, you know, it's an opportunity at an organizational level or for a hospital, um, you know, to really think about it as an engagement opportunity um, with the residents and with the community. Any comments from anyone else? Yeah, I would. Oh, yeah, I would love to leap, leap in um, and uh, just piggyback on the comments that were just made. Um, within 100 million healthier lives, we are really seeking to build um, tools um, and um, platform really to support communities in uh, accomplishing measurement that matters to them and will drive improvement within their own communities. And so, the answer to the the question of how to survey and what to survey and how best to do that really starts with the context of the community themselves. What is the purpose of um, utilizing a survey and collecting primary data? How will it be used to inform um, tracking um, or action? And so we have many communities who start with convenience sampling and paper and pencil um, in order to just begin to get an understanding of um, the lay of the land, how to utilize um, data, and then they start to understand the power of data and what it means to actually collect data from and with their um, community members. And then from there, uh, many will then move into utilizing um, the measures in a way that um, is rapid cycle improvement, using quality improvement science in order to really um, drive um, change in their community over time. And then others are gonna be really interested in understanding more of a snapshot of their population overall, and we'll look for um, sampling methods. And for that, we've actually created a guideline for sampling um, document that can be found on the 100mlives.org um, website, um, which will really help communities look and say, what am I seeking to understand? What are my resources? You know, what are the limitations that I face? And then how can I go about this in as rigorous a fashion as possible? Um, and so there's some really practical um, tips in there and connections to some other um, really fantastic um, toolkits um, that are already existing. Um, we've also been creating a Measure What Matters platform, um, which has embedded within it a process that guides communities through developing an initiative and developing a measurement framework for themselves. And there's a bit of a, a wizard that's a part of it that really um, helps particularly communities who may not be very familiar with or comfortable already in measurement to really get on board with understanding um, their data. There's also a way in which they can use um, the platform both to input data and get reports back, um, as well as do primary data collection with direct entry um, from survey um, items as well. And this is a tool and platform that just continues to evolve as communities are using it and as we continue to invest in it. And it's really designed um, to help 
communities or groups that are interested in um, harnessing power of data, including self-report primary collected data, as well as secondary data in a way that will serve uh, them. Great. Um, so we're just about out of time. We, um, we have time for one more question. It's really hard to choose because there's so many good ones. Um, maybe, maybe we'll try to do two quick questions if people can, can give really quick responses. Um, so do any of these tools measure the cost of addressing social determinants of health for hospitals? And are there certain measures that resonate with all of the, all of the, with, um, oh, with payers in particular, but maybe we can broaden it. Are there, are there certain metrics that, um, that you think are really powerful health proxies as well? Maybe I'll just kind of add on to that question a little. So, um, Let's, let's uh, go around and have everyone give a really quick response to, to one or both of those questions. Um, Tiffany, let's start with you. Sure. So, um, so one, of the, one part of the uh, Opportunity 360 platform focus is really on evaluation. And it's probably a misnomer in terms of the name because what it really does is look at some of the ways, some of the templates that enterprise uses, not only to address that, how we evaluate our programs, how we think about the impact and do impact assessments, but I think with that, what that um, comment is getting at is really the latter part of that, is really the social returns on investments. So how do you take outcomes, the fact that people may be getting healthier, they may have lower stress, or all those kinds of outcomes, and then, and then translate that into what it means from a value proposition statement back to whomever, not just, not just the hospitals, but to a whole range of folks in that community for which a healthier person embodied in the folks that you are represented is actually a very useful and, 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 um, and financially profitable thing. So we provide uh, some examples of the kind of social return on investments that we do that look at, here are the outcomes that we found, and then here's a way to monetize those. Not because we think that every outcome should be monetized, because by doing that, trans that translation, we're able to speak to hospitals and others who have a vested interest in, invest in, in investing resources for which that kind of calculation is absolutely necessary if you're going to ask for those kind of investments. So I would just point to those as just resources for folks who are interested in that kind of calculation. Great. And uh, the debt, 30-second response. <laughs> um, so again, back to this example of our local hospital at Boston Medical Center, um, who often talks about, you know, the mandate for no margin, no mission, kind of. You know, on one hand, we know that, you know, 25% of the healthcare dollars are spent on like 1% of the population, right? And that those frequent users are influenced by social determinants. Um, and as Tiffany pointed out, the, one of the number one things is housing, housing stability, housing, housing, housing. Um, and so for us, our tool doesn't necessarily directly quantify the healthcare cost, but uh, with this particular institution, they had done a survey of their patients and found out that 25% of their patients admitted were homeless and that there were a lot of housing instability issues in their footprint partly due to the development pressure that was happening around the hospital. Um, and so for us, it was less about providing a tool for the hospital to uh, take a direct measure um, of the cost, but more providing uh, a, a solution, a development solution that would help to provide some of that temporary and affordable housing for the people that they serve. Um, and so for them to meet the mandate of, you know, no mission, no margin, it was kind of a slam dunk to be able to invest in the Healthy Neighborhoods Equity Fund as a way to build more affordable housing connected to healthy food, transportation, and opportunity. Great. And quick response from Jessica. Sure. So our tool also does not directly um, evaluate those costs, but for organizations that are using it, um, so for one example, there's an organization um, working, I think I used it as a previous example, um, providing wraparound services for recently homeless folks. And um, they are using some of the social data they're gathering on stable housing and the theme, you know, you see the theme, um, and connecting that with healthcare data um, to be able to make that link. And so, you know, this, the providing the tool to look at the social aspects and the behavioral aspects um, related to the housing has, has given them the information to link up with their provider data um, and to make that case. Great. And Carly? 10-second response. <laughs> sure. I would say that um, there are multiple communities that are utilizing um, the multiple tiers of um, 
drivers from the people to community to societal in order to contextualize well being within their own communities. And there are many measures for that available for communities who want to utilize those measures, some of them looking at um, cost or value um, on the Measure What Matters platform. And I would just push and say that whenever we're talking about cost, we really should be talking about value and we should be valuing what matters to the people, um, which I would say including self-report within that and, you know, and something along the lines of well-being or overall life evaluation is really critical um, for us to be under, able to understand what we mean when we're talking about cost. Great. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for your excellent questions. And um, thank you so much again to our speakers today, Vedette, Tiffany, Jessica, and Carly. We've actually provided links to all of the tools we discussed today in the chat. And you can also access them all on our Measure Up site at buildhealthyplaces.org backslash measure up. And if you missed any portion of today's discussion, we're actually going to post a recording, a YouTube recording on our Build Healthy Places Network YouTube channel, and we will send that to you via email. And finally, if you're interested in learning more about cross-sector collaboration and would like to attend future events like this, be sure to sign up for our newsletter at buildhealthyplaces.org. Um, so with that, thank you, and we'll see you next time.